So just really trying to make sure that the places that you are applying to, the places that you are ranking to, are places that you could see yourself there and that you could potentially be happy. Do you ever have so many questions and no one to ask, so they're just wasting away on Google searches you'll forget about in an hour or so? We had that same problem, and that's why we created the RD to be podcast, a resource for dietetic and nutrition students looking for answers that their peers don't have. We are students Macy and Emily and registered dietitian Carl Barnes. We engage in conversations and learn from RDs. Join us weekly as we gain insight into the unique journeys of registered dietitians all over the country. Welcome back to another week of the RD to B podcast. I'm your registered dietitian host, Carl Barnes. This is our weekly podcast where we cover a different dietitian each week um, to showcase the diversity of opportunity in the profession. Right now, we're doing a showcase of dietetic internships um, to highlight those programs for those who are prospective students, um, whether you're about to apply or applying um, a couple years from now. So we're honored to be sitting with Crystal Wynn, PhD from Virginia State University today. Um, really curious to hear about your program and a little bit about you. Thanks for being here. Hello, everyone. My name is Crystal Wynn, and I am a professor at Virginia State University, where I serve as the department chair of the Department of Family and Consumer Sciences and the Dietetic Internship Director. Um, I've been at VSU for about 10 years. Um, and I, I love educating our students. Awesome. Thank you so much for taking time out to talk to us today. So how do you ensure that all your accreditation standards, policies, and procedures are met for the interns that are completing your internship at VSU? So as the internship director, um, I'm constantly reviewing the accreditation standards, the policies and procedures, that's set out by ASCEND. And I'm also um, responsible for attending any required meetings or webinars um, that would notify me of a change. So with that, um, this is constantly on my radar. So I'm constantly reviewing documents um, that involve the interns, that involve the other dietetic internship faculty members preceptors and just constantly making them aware of their role in the accreditation process and making sure that we are following the standards um, as it relates to our program evaluation, our curriculum, and our student learning outcomes. Great. So with the shift of the pandemic, how did that look for your internship? Um, so... I guess around March 2020 is kind of where everything shifted. Um, so at that time, our university um, put a cease on all student activities. And so at that time, we had to um, pull our interns out of their rotations and make them all virtual. Um, so in the beginning, it, it was a hurdle um, because we didn't have anything set up, but there were a lot of resources out there um, that educators kind of shared through our accrediting agency and our educator um, listserv through um, in-depth. So that was, you know, very helpful. Our preceptors were, you know, very understanding. Um, some of them still kind of stayed involved kind of as a like an advisory role. Um, but a lot of them kind of stepped out. So it was the DI coordinator and myself that kind of were overseeing and precepting. So I would say the first spring that it occurred, um, it was a lot. But then last year, um, it, it got better because we'd already took the time to create uh, virtual rotations. And a lot of our major like clinical um, facilities were beginning to allow students to come in. So our students that completed the internship 2021, they kind of had more of a hybrid model. So it was probably like half of their rotations were face-to-face -face, while the other half were kind of in a, a virtual um, capacity. Um, and then currently, um, we haven't had any issues with getting students um, in facilities. So for the most part, they're probably about 90% um, 
with face-to-face -face rotations. Great. So I remember when we were initially, you know, talking back and forth, you mentioned that you were very passionate about diversity in dietetics. So as an internship director, what are some things that you do to try to incorporate diversity in your curriculum? Um, so currently we um, have students to complete a, a diversity, equity, inclusion webinar um, during the spring of the program. And then they're required to complete a cultural competence in the fall. Um, so that's kind of one way that we um, incorporate diversity into the curriculum. But in regards to our admission standards, um, we do offer pre-select to our um, undergraduate students at Virginia State, and we do um, try to show priority to those that are members of a diverse group that have been identified by the academy. Um, so that's one way. And then we try to partner with our state affiliate um, to ensure our uh, interns as well as our undergraduate students have um, mentors um, and that they are um, just really, I guess, aware of the issues that face dietetics um, in, in the area of diversity. Great. So what would you say that your dietetic internship has a concentration in? Um, so currently we have a concentration in research. And so this was established in 2012 when Ascend mandated that dietetic internships um, had to have a concentration. Um, and we, we picked uh, research because we are a land grant, 1890 land grant institution. Um, and so with that, we have a agricultural research station as well as Virginia Cooperative Extension specialists that are federal employees on our campus. So we really wanted to kind of tap into that tripod uh, land grant mission of teaching research and extension. And so our interns complete a uh, eight week research rotation with two of our food science uh, researchers. So one does research in food chemistry and food packaging, and the other uh, does research in food microbiology. Um, so interns have experience with um, hands-on bench work. Um, they have the opportunity to present a poster at a national conference, and many of them have had publications as a result of their research rotation experience at BSU. Great. So do students that come into your um, program say if they are more food microbiology or food chemistry, do they figure that out during their program? Are they assigned to certain you know, topics or do they do both? Um, so currently, um, unless someone has expressed that in their personal statement or during the onboarding process, they're kind of like randomly assigned to either one. Great, awesome. So I know that your program also offers a food and nutrition science graduate certificate. So why did you decide to do a graduate certificate opposed to maybe um, a master's degree? Um, well, first, currently our interns were not um, enrolled in the university. The internship was kind of looked at as a separate program and our office were, were actually responsible for handling you know, all of their admissions, handling their tuition and all of those things. Um, and so we just felt like it would be more um, safer for the program and be more beneficial for the student if they were enrolled into the university so that they can get the benefits, the academic and student service benefits, as well as be able to take advantage of financial aid. So the graduate certificate was our, I guess, our launch pad to um, one, getting them enrolled into the university and then the launch pad to beginning the process of developing a proposal for a master's degree. Great, so are you guys, I don't know if you would know the answer to this, but where are you guys with having the master's? Um, so right now we're in the beginning stages of developing the proposal, um, going through the university curriculum committee, then we have to go through our um, Virginia State Council of Higher Ed, as well as our um, University SAC COC accreditation. Um, 
our ASCEND has mandated that all programs have a master's degree by December 31st, 2023. And so we are currently are on track of trying to meet that deadline. So we're hoping that we can launch it fall 2023. Great. So having a concentration for research in food chemistry and food microbiology, does that go hand in hand with the graduate certificate at all? Or is that separate from the certificate? Um, so the supervised practice hours kind of um, work concurrently with the certificate. So even though our concentration is research, um, students still um, are exposed to clinical, um, food service, WIC and public health. Um, it's just that all of our rotations have a research component to it in addition to the research rotation. Um, so interns have class, class on Friday and that's kind of where they would complete the coursework for the graduate hours. So they're kind of completing the, the coursework and the hours for their rotations as well as the graduate um, coursework as well. But they're getting graduate credit and experiences um, for their rotation. So there's like two classes that are like um, clinical food and community practicum. So um, it's not, we didn't really create a, a lot of separate classes um, so we have an advanced practice in dietetics course, and they kind of complete those requirements during their orientation to the DI. And then the two practicum classes, they're getting credit for the D DI, then they have additional assignments. And then they have a food research methodology course, which is basically everything that they're completing during their research rotation. So the graduate certificate is 16 uh, graduate credit hours. Okay, so, and then they, like you said, they complete it concurrently with the DI. Yes. Great. So how long is your program? Um, so before COVID, our program was 10 months, um, mm -hmm. August to June. But during COVID, Ascend um, reduced the supervised practice hours and the amount of time mm -hmm. that interns um, needed. So now our program is from August to April, so eight months. Great. So how many interns typically apply to your program each go around? Um, so it has varied as we are getting closer to the 2024 um, deadline. So um, in the beginning, I would say probably about maybe six years ago, we were getting probably about uh, 20 to 30 applicants. And then as we're getting closer and approaching the 2024 deadline, it's probably kind of dwindled to about 10. Um, so we definitely know that students are applying more to those coordinated programs or the future education model programs. And so we're really trying to, um, you know, expedite our, our masters, you know, as soon as possible so that we will be able to service students and prepare them for the next step. How many students do you typically take to be a part of your program? So we're approved for eight spots. And so generally in the past three years, we've either um, either had pre-select or match or had to go into the second round match um, six to eight. Currently, we were only able to fill four spots. Um, and since we are in transition with preparing for our reaccreditation, um, we just kind of you know kept the four. Um, just because we have so much going on with the reaccreditation and then also trying to do the master's proposal. How do you think your internship compares to other programs in Virginia? Well, I think definitely with being um, a land grant and how we incorporate the land grant mission into our program. So in addition to interns having the research experience, they also have a farm to table experience. So they work with our horticulture and marketing extension specialists on our farm. Because we have a 418 acre farm that's about a mile and a half down from the campus. And so interns get to actually um, have exposure to um, actually the, the harvesting um, just from the ground all the way up. And they actually get to um, participate in farmer's markets with the extension specialists. Um, they also have various marketing projects. Um, they work with our culinary specialists and try to come up with um, creative recipes and dishes that they can market 
the crops that are grown on the Randolph farm to the consumer. Um, so they actually get to see their um, brochure or their presentation um, being used by Virginia Cooperative Extension Specialists. So I would say because we really integrate our land grant mission within the program, um, that's what set us apart from the other uh, dietetic internship programs in the state. Awesome. Yeah, I feel because I know the I go to University of Maryland and they're also a land grant institute and they really have a strong emphasis on that farm to table approach as well. So that's really interesting to hear that an internship has that as well. So when you're looking through applications, what stands out to you for a potential intern? Um, I guess for me, I mean, I really look at the intern that has had a variety of experiences. Um, so whether it be, you know, clinical, food service, public health, research, or study abroad, um, just kind of want to, you know, make sure that the intern is well-rounded, um, that they um, did not just go, you know, to school for four years and, and that's it, and to coursework, but just looking at the well-roundedness, you know, whether they had the paid experiences or the volunteer experiences in the field. So... I love that you mentioned that. So students, at least I'll talk from my experience. I find it hard to, you know, as a dietetic student, find experiences that pay. So as someone that is looking at these applications and looking at volunteer versus paid experience, what can we as applicants show you that like we're dedicated to it, we really care about it, but unfortunately the facility or the people weren't willing to pay if that makes any sense. Yes, it does. Um, well, for me personally, I mean, I don't weigh volunteer, well, paid over volunteer. Um, I just want students to have experiences. So for me, it doesn't really matter whether it's volunteer or, or paid. Um, I would say, you know, in the descriptions, um, whether students have to describe the experiences, they need to be, you know, as descriptive as possible. And they can also highlight, you know, some of the key experiences that they completed in their personal statement. Um, I find sometimes, you know, either due to interns not or applicants not preparing um, for the application process, you know, ahead of time, sometimes we'll see where an applicant has listed a lot of experiences on their resume, but they didn't take the time to enter it into DICAST. Um, so it's just really important for um, applicants to be consistent throughout and just making sure their application capture all of their experiences. Most definitely. I was talking to my mentor about that, actually, and they're like, make sure that you don't only upload your resume, but make sure you follow everything that the application says, because to students, it's like, why do we have to upload our experience after we just uploaded our resume? But I feel what I was, how they explained it to me is that they look at your um, those in like when you insert your information they don't really look at your resume unless there's like an interview so it's really yeah good here. so what do you think prospective interns should prepare for more before they go into the internship for their first day? um i mean I, I would say one i'm just really trying to uh, make sure they have a I guess a baseline grasp of medical nutrition therapy. Um, and I know most programs have students to do prep work over the summer. So just really trying to, um, you know, just let them know to kind of not just go through the motions, but really take the time to read, study and prepare um, because clinical is usually the one rotation that people, you know, generally may have problems. Um, and then also, um, for those that are, you know, I guess still, I guess, applying, uh, making sure they get the variety of experiences in the field, and then making sure they're intentional in selecting um, people that are going to do recommendation letters for them. Um, because I've seen over time where uh, recommendations have been not favorable. And I think that if the, in the prospective student if they knew in, ahead of time that the person was not going to write them a favorable reference, they probably would not have asked them. So, you know, just trying to make sure that those that you ask to, to write a recommendation letter that you're confident that they're going to speak on your behalf and that they are well aware of the program that you are applying to. 
because I've had where people either um, got the name of the applicant wrong, you know, typed another name, or they got the program name wrong, or, you know, they uh, were, you know, saying that they were getting into graduate school, but this was a standalone internship. So it's those kinds of things, just making sure, you know, those that are being, are asked to write the recommendation that they are, you know, well-informed and that they're confident that they're going to write a favorable recommendation for them. Because we've, we've not ranked people, even though everything was good, because their recommendation letters were poor. Yeah, most definitely. That's yeah. another thing that I've heard, even from my DPD director, make sure you choose people that will write you a good letter of recommendation. Don't choose someone that you have a poor relationship with that'll say, yeah, this intern will not do well in your program because of A, B, C, and D. Yeah. If you have someone that can speak to all of your qualities. So do you guys have any upcoming open houses that students can attend? Um, we do have a, a virtual um, open house. Well, it's kind of like a recruitment session that we do on Tuesday, October 25th, and it's from 4 to 5 p.m. Eastern time. So if individuals are interested in jumping in, um, they can send me an email directly um, at crwynn, W-Y-N-N, at bsu.edu um, to get the Zoom link. Awesome, thank you so much. And I guess what's one final piece of advice that you have for students that are preparing for the upcoming DICAS application? Um, I think they also, you know, need to have a plan B. Um, it's, it's really important to, you know, not put all of your, as they say, eggs in one basket. Um, you need to, you know, if, if you do not get matched, you know, are you prepared to enter the second round match? Um, do you have, you know, graduate school as a backup? Um, do you have any idea, you know, what jobs are in your area? So I think, you know, students really need to have mapped out um, a plan B. And then also they need to be prepared um, and be aware, I guess, of the financial, um, this financial responsibility to the internship, because um, I've had a student in the past who have matched the internship and they were not aware they had to pay tuition for the internship. So just trying to make sure, you know, students are aware, you know, of all the programs that they are applying to, you know, how much it costs, if the program participates in the federal financial aid, if they'll have to get personal loans, um, if there is there a payment plan, and then they need to figure out the housing situation. Because um, I, I have students who, you know, every year, um, you know, trying to figure out, you know, are they able to find housing? Um, so I, I think, I mean, in an ideal world, it'd be good to apply to programs where you have friends or family, you know, already, you know, geographically located, um, because it is difficult to pack up, especially in an internship, because a lot of times as an intern, it's difficult to get housing on campus unless you are, you know, affiliated with a, a master's, a full-time master's degree. Um, so just, you know, really ensure interns do or prospective students do their research. And also, um, and I've had the situation come up a couple of times, if, if students have issues with being homesick or they feel like they need to, you know, see their family every so often, they need to apply to a program that they can get to their family, you know, within four to five hour drive. Because um, I've had where interns have been miserable, you know, all year because they were they were from the West Coast, but they were, you know, coming to a program on the East Coast and they could not quickly get to their family. Um, and it just really put a strain on the overall program um, because we were all trying to help them navigate it. But of course, we couldn't fulfill the need of the family. Um, so just really trying to make sure that the places that you are applying to, the places that you are ranking to are places that you could see yourself there and that you could potentially be happy. Great, I think that's a great piece of advice. Well, I appreciate you taking time out to talk to us today. It's been a great opportunity to learn about your program, especially another land grant university. Oh yes, it's been my pleasure. Thank you for the invite. No problem.